Well, a typical day in harvest is like, you come out here at seven in the morning, sometimes you don't go back in until seven in the evening. It is always tough having Mother Nature as a business partner, for sure. It's dry, some years it's super wet, this year we got both. It's all up and down, it's always up and down. You have to communicate with the operas. You start with the rootstocks, and the rootstocks are growing on a stool bed. So every year, growers take these rootstocks off the stool beds, and that gives the rootstocks that we have right here. So in the past, we grow for high density orchard, mostly M9 rootstocks. Nowadays, they, have, they come with a new variety like this, Geneva rootstocks. They come from the University, Cornell University in New York State. Uh, they don't get fire blight anymore. So when you can catch fire blight, it's a bacterial, it can affect your whole orchard. So with, and especially with young planting, it can destroy your whole orchard. So that is nice that we got now a rootstock that is a resistance against uh, fire blight. The depth of all the rootstocks that we are planting is the same when you do it with the machine. So the guys, one guy supplies the planters with the rootstocks and they plant every on the wheel. It's marked that every foot there will be a tree in the ground so that we keep the right distance and everything. After that, when it starts growing, we're gonna put a bamboo with the tree and we're gonna tape them so that they grow nice and straight up. Then at the end of next year, we should have a tree, let's say, five feet high. We're gonna dig them out, and we're gonna put them in the cold storage for the winter time to avoid that we get uh, frost damage during the winter. When we plant the trees, it's a two years process before they go to the orchard. In this system here, these trees are at 3,000 trees the acre, right here where we are. So it took us, between year three and four, we were up to the top wire. So the old style was the big trees, the ladders right up against them, jumping on up. So you'll notice the trees are a lot smaller and we're able to get upwards of 80 apples per tree. And as you drive by the orchards, you might not expect that. But yeah, yeah, you do get a lot more with the high density orchards. My dad and his brothers were pretty progressive that way. They started planting um, a little heavier rootstock than this called M26. All through the late 60s and 70s, by the 90s, we had them up to about 1,000 trees the acre using just M9 rootstock. And then uh, we met some guys in Kelowna that were growing orchards like this, and we planted like this in 2001. Tom adopted this system, he saw it in BC, but they use it extensively in Italy. More production off a smaller base, land base. But Tom's increased the densities quite a bit given our soil type and our climate and our weather. So we found what works for us here. And mostly in the winter time, I'm just going through these orchards and taking out bigger, older wood that needs to come out that's, that isn't fruitful. And then basically come spring, we finish the top, pruning the tops, and then um, things start to look like they're gonna start growing and hopefully we see a little bit of green and that's our first hint that we've got some fruit bud showing. And unfortunately this year when that started to happen, so did Jack Frost came on the scene. 
And we had 20, 20, 22 nights here that it froze. I literally thought we were gonna get wiped out. We had two nights up on the hill here, we flew a helicopter, and the other nights we relied on our wind machine down the low ground, and it basically ran the 22 nights. We have a wind machine that works on the same principle as a helicopter where it pushes the warm air down because luckily there can be an inversion so it pushes the warmer air down to keep the blooms from freezing. Um, and yeah, and crossed fingers, that's our other mitigation strategy. Usually our spring frost is called a radiation freeze and it's maybe 18, 20 degrees in the day and it goes down to maybe minus one or two in the evening. So you have a great inversion because the cold air is pushed down, the warm air is pushed up. In these situations that we had this past spring, there was very little inversion up high, but there was enough because when the pilots were flying, they were still finding temperatures around, oh, between zero and plus one when we were sitting at minus three and minus four down here. At the, we, we have thermometers set at the first wire here. This is where our main danger zone is. You're always gonna be warmer up high. So we're monitoring that, and um, as long as we had somewhat of an inversion, we were flying and we were running the wind machine in it, and I, I think it paid off. Like, well, it did because we have we have apples, and uh, it's very disappointing for some others. It, it, they're in a, they're in bad shape. We had this really bad weather, which is what a lot of rain, a lot of ice rain, some snow, and um, and some heavy frost, and then that hurt the blossom. And with that hurting it, it won't produce any apples. So the tree is stressed out, they shed everything. I'm an agricultural worker here in Canada, I'm Jamaica. When I was back home, I was, I was in construction. But at some point, construction went downhill. And then I always heard of people traveling away to do other work overseas. So I get attached by it. I was like, okay, so this will give me an opportunity to travel. So first thing I went and I checked about it, I got selected. And from there on, I've been here. So, you know, they start from the, from the bud and then they come out with this little hair. And from that little hair, if there is flowers inside of it, then you know you're gonna have apples. Within four weeks to a month, you start seeing the leaves coming. But after that, you have the flowers come. flowers come and the flowers died off, whatever is left on that stem of the flower is what we call the apples. So basically the flower is the apple. But if we don't get some rain to help boost the growth, then they will be very small. We about 50 hives to come in. Because our tree density is what it is, we need to ensure there's enough bees to be able to reach them all. Again, we always hope for great weather because bees are like you and I. If it's windy or rainy, they don't like to go out. So we always hope for good sunny, warm weather, not too windy when they're here.
we have five trees per variety that are marked and tagged with 14 clusters of apples. There was probably 400 potential apples on this tree. We only need 50. So in a simple terms is we got to eliminate them. And we do that by chemical thinning and we do that by using this computer model and we have an app for it now that my brother developed. We use the app and, what the, and we punch in the numbers of the apples that we've measured and that tells us what is going to fall by using our chemical thinning products and then we can decide okay when we get down close to around 60 or 70 apples on a tree we will stop thinning. So what this model has done is just give us more confidence to be even more aggressive with our chemical thinning. An apple is biannual. It will only crop every other year. Some varieties are worse than others. Honeycrisp is a beast and if you fail with your chemical thinning on it, the next year you'll have nothing. We're always looking for new innovative things that are going to help us to grow better quality fruit, you know, more fruit per, uh, per hectare. And we're always looking for different companies to work with. So even this year I'm working with a, a startup out of Ontario and they're trying to get images in the orchard to be able to count and size fruit so that we know what we can market in the fall and uh, winter season technologies that are counting and sizing fruit are developing technologies. Um, it's still in the early stages, but that's, that's kind of the goal. And then later on, we can even detect, hopefully, nutrient deficiencies, different diseases and pests that are in the orchard. And it can maybe send an alert to your phone and be able to tell us, hey, go check out this row or this block. Uh, you might have an issue with you know, a certain pest or a nutrient deficiency that we can then correct. Red Prince is a special one, especially to our family. My parents had brought that over from the Netherlands shortly after we moved and decided to try the apple here in Canada, which turned out to be a great success and the marketing behind that was a great force under Blue Mountain Fruit Company name. And now after a few years, it's kind of booming in the area. And although we're the only ones that grow it currently here in Ontario, we've got uh, growers in Quebec and Nova Scotia as well now. So we're well on our way to becoming nationwide. We've got problems down low. There's not as much fruit, but um, all around, uh, it looks like we'll have maybe a 75 or 80% crop. It doesn't look too bad. The weather will dictate a lot. I think there'll be more of these freezes, more of this extreme heat we've had. This past summer, we were irrigating like crazy all through May and June. July, it didn't stop raining. step is right now we're summer pruning which means we take away some of the foliage so that the light can get to the apples. It, it gives them better flavor and it also gives a much better color. So we have to wait for them to fully ripen. Although they look beautiful at this point they are a little bit too starchy, more like a potato than an apple so we have to wait for them to switch that starch into a sugar. This time of year when we're almost done summer pruning and you get to see you see the fruit and you see it coloring and uh, that makes you feel pretty good too. Here 
is one of the oldest, it used to be a 100 acre apple orchard, we just have 10 acres of it now, but it's one of the oldest orchards in the, in the valley. Uh, we still have some of the old trees that we've left that are, are between 65 and 85 years old, so that's kind of cool. And part of our mission here is to, to return this piece of property to its, to its former glory for sure. And uh, yeah, here we are. We've been here for five years now making cider in the barn and selling it to people who come by the farm. Uh, the first one I guess we did was the spruce of the Bruce, which uses uh, spruce tips in the spring. And again, that gives it a real nice bite and grip that's, uh, that I like in a cider. The cider apple should have some, some tannin and some astringency to it. We do have our own uh, six acre orchard here, but we just planted it last spring, so we're not getting fruit from it. But we do rely on local growers. The last couple years, it's been three growers, two that are almost next door neighbors. So our process is no process. Uh, typically in making a, a more commercial cider, the first thing you do is add sulfites and that kills all the native yeast and other microbes that are existing in the, in the juice after the pressing. We go the other route. We don't use uh, sulfites and we just let the, the cider spontaneously ferment on its own. So wild fermentation, native fermentation, obviously you, using local fruit is, is an element of that but even more using the actual native yeast, whatever is existing on it, makes it even more of a, a product that's reflective of the, of the local terroir for sure. We want real precision and we want real quality and size for our markets. We, we just have to, or to get premium prices. In, within six weeks, we have to get the crop over. That's what the timeline is for harvesting, it's six weeks. Sometimes it goes into eight, but six weeks is the maximum. You know, frost is always a, a challenge, both right before the trees go into bloom, and even at harvest time, we're trying to make sure that uh, we get those late varieties off before the first frost hits. This place will be buzzing with Jamaican. Thousands. Guys comes in for harvest. You will come out here, you will hear whistling, you will hear singing. You will see guys running with ladders. Guys with a big sack on his chest, picking apples. And then you will see tractor pulling out bins of apples laying out in that lane way right there. So as the apples are received in September time and the orders start to come in, we have the back half of the plant, you'll notice it has what we call fluming, so it's pre-sorting the apples. So that'll sort the apples by size and color and quality as well, so we have different lanes that the apples will come out of and uh, the defects on the apples can be detected as small as one millimeter. So there's cameras that the apples go through, it takes 60 pictures per apple, which goes through fairly quickly and fills the bins back up by the sorted then type. From there, with the orders that we have, the apples then go into the packing side, which is the front half of the facility. So the packing side has two different halves, I guess you could say. One is like the loose apples you'll see on the shelves in the stores, and the other is the bags. Uh, so we're able to run both lines simultaneously and different varieties at the same time if those are what the orders are requesting. The apple cider, we press it once or twice a year. 
We bring in a mobile press, which is great because they've got you know everything that is supposed to be there, including the pasteurization. So we make up a blend. It's always better than having just one variety in there. We have a fellow that helps us do the blending. Each year the apples taste a little bit different. So we have to get the right quantities of the different apples that go in there. But no, it's a really great experience. The day we do it, it's literally, you know, hot off the press. Wonderful chilled, wonderful warmed up. Some people like to throw a little whiskey in a warm cup at night, you know, so there is, it's quite good. It signifies the change of seasons for people and the Thanksgiving and, you know, the, the fruits of our labor, so to speak. <laughs>I do love pie. <laughs> oh, I, I get so many pies from neighbors and friends that I don't need to do any cooking myself, yeah. Right now, for sure, my favorite apple is the golden russet. Beautiful, sweet apple, so that turns into high alcohol, which is always fun. The ambrosia, for example, is a Canadian variety that was found in BC. In my opinion, personally, it's the best apple there is. Uh, you know, this is amazing apple country. People come here to pick apples, to see apples grow. I think the biggest challenge for younger people is going to be the weather. And there's a lot of young growers in the area. We have a young farmer group with a lot of the apple growers in Ontario. We share ideas. I think the technologies will keep advancing. Tom's absolutely driven with this. And he's very innovative and very progressive with his techniques. The only thing I would like to see is more, more Canadian be more friendlier to Jamaicans, because there are some people who will see you and they will be like, they don't even want to walk in the same aisle as you do. Ontarians luckily eat a lot of apples, so there's a lot of room for us to grow. I think there is a huge opportunity, and especially here in the Georgia Bay area where we have the microclimate, that we can grow more apples than we do at the moment, and especially for the new varieties. We, we owe this to our boss, because we already established a relationship where we come here and help him every year so he can make his thing bigger and better, and then help us to make a bigger and better back home. We're here to help. That's what we're here for. We're getting more in touch with each other. We're helping each other out. I was taught long ago, um, don't ever think you're the smartest. Find the smartest and follow them around. Anyone who's a, a farmer of any sort, it, it's in their DNA. It's in their blood. 